In the name of the one living God. Amen. I have learned some things about you in the nearly six years that I have been at St. Paul's. I have learned who gives memorial flowers, who's likely to show up for an even song or an organ concert, who tends to go away in the summertime. But I have given up on trying to predict who among you are sports fans. More than once I have been surprised, especially uh, around the time of the, when the Virginia men's basketball team won their national championship in 2019, there were some of you who I might have guessed were at least casual fans who were apparently surprised to learn that it was basketball season <laughs> or that there was some kind of tournament happening somewhere. And then there were others, people I would have picked to be deeply uninterested, maybe even deliberately uninterested, whose eyes would well up with tears while they wax poetic about the pack line defense. So I don't know who among you is familiar with the, the ritual of the post-game basketball interview, but if you are, it, this will be familiar. After the final buzzer, a player is confronted with a microphone, a sports reporter, and an open-ended question about how the game went. And there comes a moment when we can usually find ourselves somewhere on a kind of spectrum between activity and intention on the one hand, I knew I needed to be aggressive. We were able to take control. I wanted to show what I could do. And this sort of mystical passivity on the other. The shots were falling. The game just flowed. Coach told me to relax and let the game come to me. I've never understood what that means, let the game come to me, but they say it all the time. Sometimes we get this sort of paradoxical amalgamation of those two things. Like I was able to step up, assert myself, be aggressive on both ends of the floor, and you know, just sit back and let the game unfold. Well, <laughs> if the author of the Gospel of Matthew had been a basketball player, that is exactly what he would have said. On the one hand, God caused these things to happen, that the prophecies would be fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven has come near. We just happen to be here. We just happen to notice. And then on the other, get up and follow me. Order your community of faith in this way. Follow these rules. And then at the end of the gospel, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching as I have commanded you. So on the side of God is in control, we have all this reference to prophecy. This morning, in what Mark just read, we're only in chapter 4, which depending on what Bible you're reading might be the third page. We're very near the beginning. These chapters are short, and this is the seventh time in the Gospel of Mark that he says of the, the events that he is telling, this is the seventh time that he says, by the way, this happened to fulfill this prophecy. He tells of the birth of Jesus and he says, all this took place to fulfill the prophecy. He talks about uh, Herod asked the chief priests and the scribes where the baby would be born. And he says, and, and, and Herod is told in Bethlehem because the prophecy says it shall be Bethlehem then you'll remember that uh, uh, Joseph is warned in a dream to take the family to Egypt to, to escape Herod. And then Matthew says that is in order to fulfill the prophecy, out of Egypt my son shall come. Herod kills all the babies, hoping that he sweeps Jesus up in the carnage, and we get that's to fulfill the prophecy about Rachel weeping for her children. Then we get Nazareth. They go to Nazareth because there's a prophecy that says Jesus shall be a Nazarean and Matthew doesn't bother with the fact that those, that that's a sort of coincidental play on words. Nazarean doesn't seem to have anything to do with Nazareth, but he doesn't let that get in his way. It's to fulfill the prophecy. And then John, baptizing at the Jordan, shows up and is identified unequivocally as the one of whom Isaiah spoke. 
So by the time we get to this morning's reference to Zebulun and Naphtali, it's the seventh time. Galilee of the Gentiles. And again, Matthew doesn't concern himself with the fact that once Jesus gets out into Galilee doing his thing, he seems to be moving among the Jews. He's teaching in the synagogues. But the land is referred to in Isaiah as Galilee of the Gentiles. So it's to fulfill the prophecy. All this prophecy business is one of the things that Matthew's known for, sometimes, sometimes referred to as uh, the most Jewish gospel, which is, uh, which is a little bit misleading. Uh, because, of course, all the gospel writers are Jews, and Jesus' whole world and all four gospels is a deeply Jewish world. But, but Matthew has this particular priority on emphasizing and illuminating the continuity between the tradition and the prophecy and the revelation of God in Christ. Matthew's also known for these explicit directions much more so than the other Gospels, about how the church is to be ordered. Here's how you're going to do it. Here's how you're going to have a community of faith. And then Matthew is the Gospel of the Epiphany. What we call the Epiphany, which we celebrated on the 6th of January, the, the wise men and the stars, that only happens in Matthew. It doesn't happen in any of the other Gospels. And it's about God's mission to the whole world. We know very little about these people that we call the wise men, but we know that they're from far away. We know that they're not part of the, uh, of the Jewish tradition, culture, religion. So it's a story of uh, this, this religion, of this God being made known sort of astonishingly to outsiders at a distance who get drawn in. That's the beginning of Matthew's gospel, and then at the end, the Great Commission go and make disciples. So, and that's tricky. That's a tricky dynamic. The instruction to go and make disciples, that activity, because knowing what we know after these many centuries about the history of the church erring on the side of aggression and domination and coercion in its effort to make disciples, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of instances where Christians might have done well to let the game come to them a little more. But in between that star that the wise men followed and the instruction from the resurrected Christ in chapter 28 comes this proclamation again and again, first from John and then verbatim from Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's wondrous and mysterious and paradoxical this balance, I don't even know if it's a balance, maybe it's just a paradox between the activity and the passivity. Even Jesus in this little, this little piece that we had today, even Jesus goes from withdrawing to Galilee, retreat. He withdraws to Galilee. It's hard to read that as anything other than a retreat from the earthly threat. He heard that John had been arrested and he goes off to the hinterlands as if to keep his head down. And then just a few verses later, he's off throughout Galilee, teaching and healing and curing every disease. The kingdom has come near. We so often think of our proximity to the kingdom or of our entering the kingdom or having an encounter with God as this sort of triumphant reward at the end of the hero's journey. And when we frame it that way, it's pretty easy to conclude that we're not the hero. So why bother with the journey? But as Jesus and the disciples go healing and teaching and curing disease in Galilee, they are the ones doing the traveling. They are the ones on the journey. It is God making the journey. In village after village, people are minding their own business, and God literally just shows up. In Matthew's telling, in John the Baptist's telling, even in Jesus' own telling, the kingdom has come near. And what the people do or don't do is to notice it. In the way that the wise men, with no training in the tradition, no familiarity with the prophecy, noticed 
the activity of God. And only then did their journey begin. There's nothing in the story to say that the star they followed wasn't perfectly visible to anybody else who bothered to notice it. It just says that they were moved to follow it. So this epiphany season, we're in the gospel of Matthew. We're in this three-year lectionary cycle. Every year in epiphany, we either get a lot of Matthew or a lot of Mark or a lot of Luke. And this year, it's, this year it's Matthew. So in epiphany season, we're in the gospel that tells us of the epiphany. Now, I'm not any better at guessing who is a Bible reader than I am at guessing who's a sports fan. So I don't know how many of you might actually read the Gospel of Matthew in the coming weeks, but if you chose to do it, if you chose to do it, you could probably do it in less than an hour. Others of you might just listen Sunday by Sunday to the epiphany stories that we're going to hear in the next few weeks. But whichever you choose, I, I, I invite you, I invite all of us in this epiphany season to pray over these dynamics in our own lives. Where have we tried too hard? Where have we sought to lead God instead of following? Where have we sought to win the challenge of being faithful instead of accepting the presence of God and the gift of God's love? And where have we been too passive? Where have we allowed God to pass by unnoticed or unacknowledged and gone back to business as usual? Where, where in our lives can we see this mystical interplay of God's initiative, our own noticing or ignoring, our passivity or activity, our, experience of, our experiences of being chosen by God versus our experiences of choosing for or against God? Where can we perceive the ways in which we, flawed, faithless, distracted, and doubtful as we are, might, by noticing the light of God shining over all creation, might actually become the light of God? In where will we see this wonderful, sometimes paradoxical way in which God shows up unexpectedly, unbidden, and we are called to respond in ways that sometimes look like active, deliberate effort, in ways that sometimes look like passive, receptive assent, but that leads always to the fulfillment, not of our ambitions and aspirations for ourselves, but the fulfillment of God's promises and intentions for the whole world. Amen.